Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Imagine the Future. My name is Jeremy uh, Franchese, joined by Eric Dominguez. This is February's This Month in Cyber, and we got a lot to cover. I'm going to give you the rundown, uh, what we're going to cover, and then we'll get right into it. Uh, we added a new segment in this uh, for a catch-up, right? There's not We didn't catch everything from the month prior. Uh, there's three stories that we want to comment on. Uh, from January 1, CIS of FBI and EPA released uh, incident response guide for water and wastewater system sector. There's a continued focus on, the, on building resilience in uh, utilities and infrastructure. We want to talk about that. Uh, the Pwn to Own 2024 event took place and uh, a lot of takeaways from it, but the main focus that we want to uh, bring to the center was uh, the electric vehicles were at the center of it, Tesla and other makers. And as we have the EV market continue to expand, uh, it becomes an access point and, and a potential target, not just the vehicles, but the chargers, the operating systems, and the different components. And so we want to unpack what that may mean uh, from a threat landscape, from a user manufacturer. We'll get into that. And then Fulton County suffers power outages as the cyber attacks continue. It's a story I think a lot of uh, uh, folks picked up. Uh, what I wanted to pick up and what Eric and I wanted to discuss was there's there's language in the story and the reporting of it that gave the impression of when they were in the network, they were moving laterally in the network. That story we want to unpack, not through the lens of what's happening, but understanding potentially what does it mean when somebody's able to navigate and, and move inside of your network so you can make sense mm -hmm. of how that affects building resilience and what we mean. That covers the January catch up. Turn the page to February, a lot of stuff going on. Uh, incidences and breaches, there's two main focus areas we're going to hit on. One is uh, China infiltrates U.S. critical infrastructure in the ramp up to conflict. Jen Easterly, uh, director for CISA, was in the select uh, uh, House Select Committee speaking on this. Top priority, we're going to unpack what that looks like, what it means, big story. And then ongoing Azure compromises target senior execs, Microsoft 365 apps. Now, not not hammering on, on Microsoft right now. What we do want to look at this story through the lens of is there are these master keys, these, these locks, uh, whether it's your Facebook login that you use for many different applications when you download because it's easy for you, your Google login, your Microsoft 365, and a myriad other options that instead of setting up a new username, a new password, a new credential, you just use the other ones. What we want to talk about is, is uh, a bit of the, the psychology around that and how that affects the threat landscape because if they get somebody's Google login or their Microsoft 365, five login, uh, it, it means that they may have access to many other things in just that one access point. So we'll talk about that. Uh, turn the page to regulatory and government. Uh, again, CISA Director Jen Easterly gave her opening statement before the House Select Committee on strategic competition between the U.S. and the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, this is a huge story. Uh, she talked about a number of different things, but uh, the sim and it was. I'll be honest. I'll say this right now. I think she was. I think it was a phenomenal address. I think it was pointed. It was unemotional. It was pragmatic, and it was direct in saying we have to step our game up and get 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 our our ish together, right, if you will. Uh, and so we'll get into that and what that looks like. Um, because it is it is coming. Uh, and then we'll transition into something actually that was released last year, the SEC rules on cybersecurity incident disclosure. That This went live in July 23, uh, but we've now got a couple quarters of this being being uh, something we're held accountable to. A couple of things are starting to bubble. Uh, what we want to talk about is now that these organizations, these publicly traded companies have to report to shareholders when they have a material breach, it's good because it provides transparency to, to shareholders, but it also means that you're you're telling the world of adversaries, hey, we got a sick patient here, poke the bear, right? Find another right. opening because they're down. And so we want to unpack the benefits of this, but also the other side of it where it's not a, a, a hundred percent everything's perfect. It does create an opening. We'll talk about that. Uh, OWASP released uh, their LLM AI security and governance checklist. We'll go through that. And uh at that point, we'll probably wrap up with a couple events coming up over the next couple months, and we will be on our merry way. All right, Eric, uh, I like starting off before we get into the stories. Where's your head at these days? So, so you know, when we caught up for the first of this month in cyber, uh, it was turn of the new year, a lot of stuff going on. We had the mother of all breaches uh, on the back of, you know, FEMA and CISA doing a joint incident response. Uh, there's there's definitely focus on infrastructure, uh, definitely definitely a lot going on in, in, in this space. But, um, you know, I'm just curious on how you would describe your mindset right now and, and your thoughts around the state of cyber month two of 2024. Right. Um, I would say right now where where I'm really thinking on on things is just um, seeing how the world is getting prepared for something. Um, you know, I, and you see that in a lot of the stories that you just touched on and, and that we'll kind of deep dive into a little bit. You know, uh, there's there's the aspect of accountability that um, 
a lot of companies are starting to uh, be forced into, uh, you know, with SEC rulings and stuff like that. But also all of the infrastructure stuff, um, you know, there's just, uh, I guess, preparation for things because right now there there's a lot of conflict in the world. Um, and it is, uh, we're, we're kind of stirring up hornet's nests all over, all over the globe, you know? Um, and so we don't know which one is going to try and sting us to, you know, keep that metaphor going, but we can be rest assured that, um, the one thing that we have to do, um, just in cyber in general, um, is continue to be diligent. I mean, now is absolutely not the time for us to start, uh, getting, you know, restful or think that things are um, getting easier. Uh, if anything, all of this emerging technology, all of these extra yeah. ways of bad guys infiltrating and, you know, getting into our environments um, is yeah. is going to be something that we absolutely have to be on top of. Yeah, I think it's said really well. Last episode, we pinned, uh, we, we we hit one point really hard, which was really the business impact of, of cyber and mm -hmm. understanding that it's not cyber in isolation or the IT of cyber, but it's really understanding that the role it plays is to enable and protect on the mission of the organization. If you're North Face and your, your mission is to deliver goods that allow people to experience a certain quality of life relative to their interests and habits, then cyber protects your supply chain, your manufacturing, your distribution, so you can get those goods to people's hands. If you're Tesla, you have your own delivery. It's not not cyber in a vacuum. So we talked a lot about the business of, of, of cyber. So it's not so much compliance, but it's security as a method to stay on offense to go to market. Um, right. This this rundown has a lot of um, a lot of federal, actually, I think a lot more of a regulatory overview. But I want to I want to get right into it with, with January. Uh, you know, the the release from CISA that, that we picked up was from January 18th. They, they titled it, you know, CISA FBI and EPA release incident response guide for water and wastewater system sector. sector. Uh, some of the language inside, it talks to the fact that uh, the reason that they published this was to assist owners and operators in the waste and water system sector with best practices for cyber incident response and, turns page dramatically, uh, information about federal roles, resources, and responsibilities for each stage of the response life life. This is the part that caught my attention. Text, technical expertise is not required to understand and use the guide. And then it went on to outline, and this was said by uh, Eric Goldstein, CISA Executive Assistant Director for Cybersecurity, and I quote, in the new year, CISA will continue to focus on taking every action possible to support target-rich cyber-poor entities like WWS Utilities by providing actionable resources X, Y, and Z. And so yeah. I want to split this thing in two. One is uh, FEMA and CISA just, just partnered together to create their incident response plan. Obviously, this is another iteration that breaks down roles, responsibilities, expectations for preparation, detection, analysis, containment, eradication, recovery, and the posted incident responses. It's a playbook, right? Right. Let's standardize. So whether you're technical or not technical, everybody knows who's doing what so we can be efficient. We can respond quickly, keep our composure, create consistent outcomes. Um, but this focus on on uh, ensuring non-technical contributors can participate and support the response effort, I think, is interesting, and it seems to be a trend. Why do you think that is? Well, um, it's an, an interesting situation, especially for me, because um, I have family that uh, kind of con contributes to this realm. Um, my uh, I have family that worked in HVAC controls. I have uh, my brother, he works in industrial controls, things of that nature. So um, it's at one point in time, you know, uh, in yesteryear, it was kind of a uh, very divided line between someone working in IT was considered quote unquote white collar, and then someone working in controls in the warehouse down in the um, in the boiler room was considered blue color. Um, right. Those that that day is gone. You know, um, you know, controls now. Um, you know, the management of systems inside of a building is no longer you know just valves. It's it's all computer control. Um, right. That is just as much of an entry point um, for a bad guy to get in and start stealing data as anywhere else. But on top of that. Um, you're talking infrastructure now. You're talking, you know, you you take out the water supply from even a building, um, 
then that building is shut down. We we actually experienced that here locally not too long ago um, due to some weather incidents and water was contaminated um, due to some bursting pipes. And suddenly, you know, hospitals couldn't op op operate. Um, doctor's offices were down. Right. So, you know, that is the reason that I see that CISA and the government itself is just saying, you know, hey, we, we got to get ahead of this. Um, it is absolutely not just, you know, blue collar guys and white collar guys. It, it is absolutely 100%. Let's, let's just get together, make sure that we are um, on the same page. Everyone's included. And the, the part that the part that threw me off and maybe this is just me but the again I, the quote throws me off in new in new in the new year in 24 CISA will continue to focus on taking every possible action to support target rich cyber poor entities target rich cyber poor entities how is our infrastructure cyber mm -hmm. poor that's mm -hmm. the part to me that it's like if it's a if it is a target rich mm -hmm. why isn't it inherently? cyber rich like I, and i i think that's the exact reason that i just mentioned um you know people were uh, they were putting that dividing line on it you know and not really realizing that you know hey when we plug this thermostat into a uh you know network port you know that's controlling the temperature of the hot water that comes out into the restroom um, that type of stuff is an entry point for bad guys. Yeah. You know, um, and it, it is absolutely cyber poor, you know, because uh, those, no one's testing that stuff. No one's going in. Those systems are chock full right now of default credentials, bad protocols, no encryption. It's across the board, just built poorly because that is built for convenience not with mm. security in mind got it you know? and so I'll, i, I want to run with that and transition into the, the second because i think you hit it head on right people just don't think of this as something that requires attention from a cybersecurity standpoint they think of it as a utility right blue right. collar but now everything's digital and so mm -hmm. our, our our agricultural uh and you know uh uh uh, community, right? It's tech enabled. You have farmers with iPads operating in the middle of their fields, collecting data, transmitting that data so that they can centralize that data to form themselves on decision, pattern, weather support, et cetera. 100%. Everything is now data and technology enabled. And so that, that brings us to, to the event. So, so, uh, Earlier in January, the Pwn to Own 2024 event was held in Tokyo. Uh, the headline is, is is buzzy as far as you know Tesla hacks dozens of zero days uh, in in electrical vehicles, uh, and and hacking teams pick apart elect, uh, EVs, exposing them for what they are safety critical computers without commensurate security. So look, I mean, everybody wants headlines that catch. These certainly catch. Uh, a couple comments, and then we'll we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, quote from the for article, uh, in just two days at the Pwn to Own 2024 in Tokyo, researchers have compromised a bevy of electric vehicle chargers, operating systems, Tesla components, and unearthed dozens of zero-day vulnerabilities along the way. Context, two days, everybody trying to break in, hack. Uh, quote from uh, Dustin Childs, head of threat awareness for uh, ZDI, the, the uh, Trend Micro Zero Day Initiative, the, the, the group that held the event over there. Uh, mm -hmm. He said, vegals are increasingly becoming a complex system of systems. Went on to say, there hasn't been a lot of research into this area in the past. And based on our experience, that lack of external scrutiny means there could be a lot of security issues. You know, obviously Tesla is the, the, the big guy in this space that people are talking about. It's no different than, than a bug bounty where somebody hacks into an Apple device, it's a big deal. Um, but this is fascinating because, I, you know, we all understand, you know, IoT devices and EV and all of these different connected devices. But I think sometimes as a consumer, we, we, we don't delineate between manufacturing risk, uh, user risk, because I don't have a login credential for my charging port. Right. So how is their risk? How can somebody gain access to it? How does that create an access point if it's connected to my home? There's all these different questions that come up that I I, I, love, I love that they're doing this because it's such a, a, an important question as the electric vehicle market continues to expand. I'm just curious what, what your thoughts are, Eric, when you think through, you know, the, the 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 state of electric vehicles, this type of an event, this type of, of thought process. I mean, is is it obvious for you, like, this is kind of what we're looking at? Or is it something that still feels very underdeveloped because, 
you know, look, it's not just about username logins. There's a lot of ways to gain access to a lot of different parts of a network, even if there isn't a traditional consumer facing authentication. Right. So uh, now here's one thing that, and then uh, just a full caveat here. I, I am not familiar with how the Tesla, you know, uh, authentication works. I do know, um, you know, I had pre-ordered a Tesla uh, in the past. So I do know that there is a uh, authentication and um, login associated with email, stuff like that. Um, all that being said, you know, like the ways that bad guys can do these things is, um, you know, just, uh, it's not even just twofold. I mean, like there are, it's exponential on the ways that it can come in. Yeah. Um, you know, and my mind immediately goes to uh, the same process as credit card skimmers. You know, when you go to a gas pump, for instance, let, let's just keep it in the in the automobile. Um, you can absolutely, uh, I've seen them before, to where it's a credit card skimmer that is placed on top of a um, the credit card machine, and as you insert it, you buy your gas. It's stealing your data. You yeah. know, works perfect. So. Now let's take that technology and combine it with the technology that is out there currently. Um, and I believe we actually gave one of these away at our um, at our CTF. Right, the switches. To where, uh huh. The um, the flippers, the yeah, uh, the uh, USB ports, the cords on those that have embedded payloads. Yeah. What's to stop a bad guy from creating a charging port? you know, on, uh, on one and putting it on the, uh, put on an unmanaged kiosk, essentially, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, there are multiple ways that this can happen. Now, the part that is very scary to me, you know, uh, because the defining the, the difference here is when you have your credit card being stolen at a gas pump, that is very much inconvenient. Yes, it, it can be very detrimental, but it is not dangerous to life immediately. Right. All right. You have a bad guy. You get ransomware that are, is put inside of your Tesla that has auto driving capabilities. Um, and suddenly uh, that software gets you know infected with something and it turns off collision detection. And it can be, you know, it can be detri truly detrimental. True. Um, so, you know, we're not talking about just stealing data at this point. Stealing data is, is big, it's big, it's major, but this goes even beyond, you know, infrastructure type things. You know, you're talking about putting people's lives in danger. Um, and that could be even accidental. You know, it could be a bad guy just wanting to do some ransomware, just trying to get a couple of Bitcoin out of it. And right. You know, he accidentally goes in and disables some stuff and interstates are now, you know, Locked. bombarded. Right. You know, because I know that there is over the air updates with Tesla and EV vehicles and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. you know, someone getting in can, can truly, uh, it can spread like wildfire. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it, we're going to talk more about this in the in the regulatory section of the the, the, the episode where Jen Easterly is talking through, uh, you know, the updates with this, the House Select Committee. But I, I want to pull one thing up that she 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 hit on pretty hard, and because it, it directly applies, and she she put pressure on on uh, two really really specific things. One is pressure on software developers for prioritizing speed over uh, security, speed to release over security. Um, mm -hmm. And then that parlaying into pressure to technology manufacturers to hold a higher standard to maintain security by design. So if we have a, a marketplace of engineers that are just trying to push, 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 because the faster the feature is released, the faster it's in the consumer hands, the faster they can market it, the faster everything's moving, they can get onto their backlog into their next sprint. You know, and then on the other side, the faster, uh, you know, to, you know, a Boeing incident where the, there isn't a great quality control in place and they're just moving things off the lot. And there's these series of quality control issues, but the impact of it is is starting to get to the point where it's like, guys, you got to let it leave the factory where it is secure by design. If you're right. sending something that has vulnerabilities and then you layer on top of that, the software supply chain component of it, you know, uh, there's challenges. And so we'll, we'll talk more about that in, in a bit. Um, but I, I think the the EV space is a really interesting space because 
it's there's it's the continuum from inconvenience like you described to true danger and violence yes. right and that's that's really the conversation around cybersecurity it's what is the the where does it fall in that continuum of inconvenience to violence because if i'm yeah. in an electric vehicle and they disable it the feature you're talking about, and I'm I'm not paying attention because I think it's self driving and it's it's detecting and it's not, then we're in a very we're in a hospital, right? Yes. On the other side of it, you know, I I almost I don't even use my debit cards because of what you just described. So I, it's a credit card only, and if it doesn't work, it's not even my money. It's the banks. I cancel it, get a new one. It's all good, right? Right. Inconvenience, violence. When we go into the Fulton story to transition, right? Uh, the Fulton County uh, outages. This has been in the news for a little bit, you know, a little while. Uh, we talk a lot about, you know, uh, the threat landscape, the potential adversary and their approach, uh, social engineering, you know, they're going to brute force something. What, what's the approach, uh, the regulation and the playbook that governs how we handle things on the front end and the back end. But, you know, this is one of those where, you know, when, when we look at, uh, for example, reading through, you know, the cybersecurity of, of Fulton County, Georgia, causing widespread IT outages this is a comment by Mark B. Cooper, the president and co-founder of, of an organization down there, uh, underlines the need for adaptive security uh, that must include a deep level of assessment, core systems, critical infrastructure, et cetera, right? Identity and encryption. Look, I, I wonder to what degree, uh, how much of this fall, falls on funding how much do you think it falls on on uh just just the assumption that you're safe I, I i wonder what the right it's just the assumption of we're good right you know but but more than that because that's where we start to get into conjecture and we start to get into a little bit of a different line of thought and, and that's not right. worth our time look when somebody's able to this phrase is in a lot of articles and you'll see it you know moving laterally in somebody's network right mm -hmm. they've gotten in now they're 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 uh they're, they're running around what does that mean? What, what's 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 the context there for when somebody's able to move laterally in somebody's network? And you know, when I look at a county official uh, in this scenario saying, at this time, we're not aware of any transfer of sensitive information, but we're still looking. How do those things come together? Where someone's in, they're able to navigate. We don't think it is, but we're still looking. Like this, it's not an overnight. Let me just use Grammarly to spell check something. Right. So, um, in the uh, in the pen test world. All right. Uh, what we consider that is called pivoting. Okay. Right? So, and, and what that essentially boils down to is this. Um, let's say that I compromise a machine um, and I then escalate myself to administrative level in that machine. That does not mean I have administrative rights in the network. All right. But administrative level in that machine means that I can steal a password from someone else who may have access to another machine that's moving laterally. All okay. right. And then when you um, escalate yourself, then you can, you know, you, you go further up the chain. Um, now in terms of what you were talking about, you know, like uh, we're safe, right. You know, um, Ignorance is, is bliss, right? Yes, yes. I mean, um, there is a a bunch of situations to where we simply, uh, and I'm not when I say we, I mean just uh, the entire industry. <clears throat> I'm not, you know, knocking on government sector, private sector, et cetera. The industry as a whole, we we definitely bury our heads in the sand in a lot of things. Um, you know, I have a, uh, I had a background uh, prior to doing this. I was a paramedic, you know that. Yep. Um, and so I, I know firsthand that 911 centers, um, first response centers, um, they have poor cybersecurity. It, it, uh, and a lot of that is due to funding um, yeah. because it is it's hard to justify. Right. You know, um, you, the part with funding, especially when you get into cybersecurity is, you are, uh, your ROI is nothing happening, you know? So um, <clears throat> it's extremely difficult for, you know, when you have a very thin budget and lean budget to say, all right, we're going to hire an expensive firm to come in and do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Um, you know, now, uh, you know, in my opinion, do does the government need to start providing grants for that type of stuff so that way they can hire a yeah. better type of you know 
firms to do that testing 100 hopefully that will come in the uh in the future right um, but as of right now you know we uh the government doing the things that it's doing um is is going to help uh but with fulton county those types of things they they're going to be more commonplace especially uh in the future because uh yeah know, my, it's, <laughs> my my fear is when they stack those against each other because if there's many small communities all handling comparable risks not uh it's like sinking a battleship like mm -hmm. you don't always need to hit the bullseye like if you can cause six leaks that are all small enough where it's not a massive threat but it's large enough to distract and require attention. That, that alone will sink the ship, right? And I'm I'm not right. I'm not a career operator in in the defense, but the me metaphor for it, meaning, right. you know, it's death by a thousand paper cuts. If you distract and you consume enough resources, time, and attention from all of these different localities, right, or or small businesses, right? We had Charles Rush on the podcast a couple of weeks back, and he was talking about the 26 million, you know, 33 million small businesses that. You know, in the age of digital, digit, uh, you know, digital work, you know, from anywhere, you got folks running two, three, four, five million dollar businesses off a laptop, a smartphone that is all directly tied between their work and personal. There's no line between the two. They're not using mm -hmm. a VPN. They're just working out of their apartment off a Comcast modem, and that is what they're running it on. But they're not thinking about, huh? I have all this credit card information, huh? I have all my customer information, huh? I just booked a trip to Maui for my wife and I on the same computer with all that information. And that's a personal credit card. And I use my Google password law, you know, all that stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's how it all wraps together to create this, this, this mess of beautiful chaos for someone interested in exploiting it. And so look, I, I want to keep the ball rolling uh, on the, on the back of that, right? Like a lot of incidences, a lot of breaches. The big thing Eric and I are committed to for, for, for you guys is not just bringing up, Hey, here's the drama from the day. Here's another incident from the day. Here's another company that I got hacked for the day and, and use, you know, fear porn. We want to bring the incidences to the surface that provide a, an interesting or unique uh, uh, discussion point. Oh, as I drop some uh, discussion point um, so that we can understand how to prepare ourselves. OK, right. and and the China, uh, uh, the conversation around China is increasingly becoming more and more top of the conversation. Uh, and so it, we got to hit it head on. J you know, January 31st, Jen Easterly, the director for CISA, uh, was in the select House committee or the House Select Committee uh, and was was there to specifically address this in this situation. I'm going to talk a little bit, bit about it. I'll frame it up. Um, but. You know, her opening statement before the House Select Committee on strategic competition between the U.S. and the uh, the 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 People's Republic of China, the Chinese Communist Party, it it hit on the evolving threat landscape. Uh, it talked about uh, their cybersecurity strategy uh, because there's some shifts in how they've been using it the last few years. The real and present danger associated with how they are handling and targeting infrastructure and energy, the proactive defense and collaboration. And she started to hit on the systemic weaknesses that we have. This right. isn't about us being bulletproof with with an iron dome, if you will. You know, a, you know, a digital dome of nobody can get through it. Uh, we're 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 not, we're imperfect, and and they're patient and persistent. Um, yeah. Actionable next step, all these different things. But again. Pressure on software developers to prioritize who are prioritizing speed of release over security and pressure on manufacturers to hold to a higher standard so that there's security by design. Those are some of the key takeaways. Let me give you some of the details beyond that, and then we'll we'll hit it head on. Uh, a quote from, from the address from Jen Easterly. And again, I want to hit it head on. I think she crushed it. Okay. I I, I don't know if you had a chance. I, I, th I think I, I think that it was it was unemotional. It was it was it was pragmatic in that sense. And mm -hmm. it was it was straight to the point. It wasn't uh, you know, uh, a political uh screaming match with Congress, right? Yeah. Um it was look, we have we have real problems here. And and here's a, a quote from it. Over the last two years, we have become increasingly concerned about a strategic shift in the People's Republic of China, uh, their malicious cyber activity against US critical infrastructure. More specifically, she went on to say, uh, we're deeply concerned that the People's Republic of China, their actors, particularly certain groups like Bolt Typhoon, which was a part of the recent incident, are seeking to compromise US critical infrastructure. Here's the important part to pre-position for disruptive uh, and destructive cyber attacks against the infrastructure in the event of a conflict, to prevent the United States from projecting power into Asia or to cause societal chaos. 
they are putting themselves in position so that when the inevitable happens, they are already able to turn off the lights. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It is complete chess moves at this point. It is 100%. It is <clears throat> beyond the point of conjecture. It is there will be a conflict. We're going to make sure that we're not waiting for it. And three years ago, they started poking the bear. I mean, really earlier, but let's call it what mm -hmm. it is. Let's call it three years ago and saying, okay, what's the easiest way to cause panic? Well, if they don't have lights, they don't have water and they don't have, they don't have internet. Let's call it what it is. Those three things go down. We are in a very different state of society. Uh, Absolutely. Because like, um, I'm going to show a little, a little bias for my, my patriotism here. Um, that, and I think it's fair to, to say that in, in both of our senses, right? I, I think it's impossible to talk about this without a little bit of bias. I would agree. But I do want to understand your take on this, your thoughts, even if it shades a little bit of the, the Eric Dominguez perspective, right? Right. Um, because the way I look at things, um, you know, and, and I followed a lot of the conflicts that are happening uh, around the world and stuff like that. Um, and whether whether you agree with it or not, you know, we're, we're talking about military type superpower. Yep. All right. In my opinion, um, no one can touch us in terms of us being the United States. Yep. All right. We, you know, we have more military spending than some companies generate revenue. I mean, it is what it is. Um, Agreed. Now, that being said, anyone uh, that would smart would know then that the only way that they could do a strategic attack against us is to do is to turn ourselves against ourselves if we are the biggest superpower then we are our own biggest threat and the only way that they can do that is by taking down infrastructure take turning off the lights turning off the water yes um and turning off the food supply and just letting nature take its course we go and if we're fighting ourselves we can't go and help someone else and we can't we definitely can't fight them i mean yeah. that's just how yeah. it pans out yeah absolutely it's you know? hard to go on offense and operate right. when, when you are internally playing survival mode and you're you're going uh, exactly uh, you know um and you know um, lord of, lord of the flies if you will right and 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 i mean like i you can absolutely see it um you know like i've done this before just on a personal uh trying it out um you can stand up a server you don't even have to have a top of the line honeypot type thing yep if you stand up a just a regular a linux server put it open on the internet and just monitor the logs all right within 24 hours you're going to start getting attacks from chinese and russian ip addresses it just it is what it is it, it just happens it's um, and it, you know like we here at eit when we do our red team when we do penetration testing stuff like that it's all based around MITRE ATT&CK framework and the MITRE ATT&CK framework is full of attacks done by Chinese and um, Russian threat actors. <clears throat> I mean, that's just, that's who we do our training around. That's what we base everything around. Um, and because that's, that's real life. I, we, you know, it's funny, right? The, the China uh, breach is, is kind of in both two segments for us, right? It's in the mm -hmm. critical incidences and breaches that occurred recently. It's also in the, the regulatory uh, side of it. Um, so I don't want to skip the Microsoft piece because I do think that's an important topic on the back of what you just shared, right? Which is, uh, you know, there are, there's low hanging fruit and then there's, there's, there's more complex targets, right? Right. But, but when you think about how does this you you just you just kind of started talking about it right with with uh, the miter attack framework the threat vectors that you're mm -hmm. using to run assessments um how does your your approach to running assessments change as these type of situations uh progress right you know it's it's no different than uh you know, I, I in correct, you know, for those listening, if, if you're more knowledgeable on this, I'm, I'm not I'm not an expert on what I'm about to say, but but it's going to give the example, right? There, there's one time where in the US, you know, like, um, you know, American soccer, European football was a little bit less dynamic than it was, they weren't using the inside of their foot to pass the ball, it was a little bit more rigid, the rudimentary, uh, the fundamentals hadn't come from Europe yet. 
you know, there was a transition in the 50s. Uh, I think it was in the 50s. Again, if I'm wrong, please tell me. I, I, but, uh, you know, and there was a transition where coaches and players started coming from Europe and introducing a different way of playing the game where you organized a little bit differently. You used the instep of your of your foot to pass the ball instead of the laces. You started to see a different way of performing. And mm-hmm. um, as you see and learn, you adopt your you adapt your strategy. I look at this very similarly, right? Where I, I look at it and say, man, they're spending years to get in position to do things. Our responsibility to our clients is to ensure that they're not just looking at a short term level of resilience or, or state of readiness. It's are you resilient long term? Because a target can take three years to get into that organization. And if they get in, they get in, right? And so there's the continuous right. monitoring component to it. There's the zero trust component of like, are you permanently skeptical of what's on your network or are you assumptive in nature of, well, we did it a couple of years ago, right? I heard a perfect example of this uh, not too long ago. I'm trying to think who gave it because I, I want to give them credit, but they basically gave the example of pen testing and, and red teaming and, and assessment work uh, to having, you know, having your, your you know, 12 year old, daughter 12 year old son and them saying hey i just cleaned my room and then you wake up the next morning and you say well they cleaned it yesterday it must still be clean right right and and then being <clears throat> and then waiting a year and being like well they cleaned it last year so it must still be clean in reality we all know if you have kids that thing is probably blown up already right <laughs> exactly yeah yeah 100 so, percent. but how does it affect your your approach your strategy and the way you you consider the need for the role the role assessment plays the role these type of services play in helping these these not just government customers but the these these private enterprises these big organizations with with unbelievably large amount of data sets we got a resilient and we got a patient adversary how does that affect how you approach things Right. So um, there are different, you know, companies do things differently. Um, One of the things that I am a firm believer in here, um, you know, and and this is something that I, I tell the guys on the team, um, you know, uh, if you see something, start chasing it. Um, And and when I say see something, I don't mean like in a client environment. I mean, if you see something that interests you, chase it, see what's going on. You know, just yesterday, um, I got a notice about some zero day activity that was happening in Microsoft Outlook. Um, immediately forwarded that to the guys on the team and said, hey, yeah. start playing with this. What what can we do with this? You know, um, because, you know, the the days of strictly, you know, running an exploit, getting admin credentials and tied a server and then using that to pivot around, that is so very rare now. Um, right. you know, the things that the entry point and, and I, I don't know the exact statistic here, but in my opinion, it would be close to the 90% range of social engineering. Someone is going to send a document, send a, a payload, click a link, et cetera. So they're going to, or the bad guys are strictly going to guess yep. a password because it's easy to guess and boom they're inside the network and then that's when they're going to start doing the pivoting lateral movement etc that's how they're going to get in um and even yeah even even on the small side right i'll get an email that that's 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 like hey here's the invoice if you could pay it you know as soon as possible that'd be great somebody i never did work with a totally innocuous op you know uh and then you look at obviously you're not going to click it but it's, it's you know if you're a large organization running payables you're going to get mm-hmm. hundreds, if not thousands of invoices, if not tens of thousands, depending on how many contractors and how much flows through the organization. One one invoice that you're like, uh, we paid this graphic designer in, you know, Croatia right. $400 to do support a PowerPoint design. Okay, whatever. What's the invoice? You click the link to go to their PayPal and you're like, oh, right. Um, yeah, and here's the, the it's, here's it's, the it's, Delta. I, I don't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. No, run with it. Um one of the things that I see uh, on a, almost on a daily basis, and we have this conversation with clients all the time, is we ask them when we're doing a social engineering campaign <clears throat> to allow list us to where the bad email, the social engineering email gets into the inbox. And that ultimately always turns into a, um, well, the bad guys aren't going to be allow listed. Why should we allow list you? That, that's the argument. 
And it makes sense on the top, but what we're wanting to do is ensure, you know, like we're testing that 1% that gets through. You're testing the, the, psycho the, the readiness of the people and their training. Of the people, exactly. That 1% that gets through, we want to make sure that the people who get that, who gets to their inbox, are they going to um, click the link? Are they going to put the password in, you know? And that kind of fall goes back to where we were talking about just the state of the industry as a whole. Right. So many people, so many companies out there are more interested in getting a squeaking report than they are actually securing their environment. Right. And that is why we still have so many cyber incidents that are popping up. They want that clean report. And in order to get that clean report, they're going to water down the scope. They're going to uh, stack the deck when it, you know, when it comes to social engineering, they're not, they're going to tell their employees, Hey, you got a social engineering coming up because we have an assessment, be on the lookout. You know? Right. Which the bad is, guys aren't going to give you a, a heads up, you yeah. know? The challenge is at the end of the day, um, it's like going to the doctor, which we, we always, we always uh, analogize, like going, going and getting a checkup. Like if you water down what you ask of your doctor to look at, then right. you lack the awareness to know what's actually wrong. What can I fix? What can I do? Mm -hmm. uh, hey, I, I want to keep the ball rolling. Uh, you know, you, you hit a head on, right? That that um, every company is different. Uh, but the social engineering are are the adversary is continuing to become more and more sophisticated, right? And uh, whether you you are allowed listed or not, it always will come back to a human. Right. right. Whether 100%. it's their, 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 their diligence on the software development and being secure on that side of the equation, whether it's a manufacturer and they're making sure that they're, they're secure by design, whether it's somebody in marketing that just pays attention to the email that they shouldn't be clicking on. And, but it says, Hey, you know, we have this promo that we're running for a thousand dollar video for twenty nine ninety nine. If you sign up today, like, and like, yeah, that makes me look good. Click. Right. Most things are just in everybody's self interest, and they they move towards it. Uh, but I want I want to talk about this this Azure story because I think what we just discussed kind of blends the line between like this big incident with China uh, related to them you know getting into our critical infrastructure and the 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 the, the policy regulatory piece. But I don't want us to skip on um, the story being the ongoing Azure compromises target senior execs Microsoft three sixty five apps. I, I want to compress this because I want us to keep moving from a time standpoint, but. Look, there's a lot of ways to gain access to, to a system and, and a network and, and and the opportunity to retrieve data and information, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are a series of master credentials like a Microsoft login, a Google login, a Facebook login, a Twitter login. Like there are certain uh, keys that have become ubiquitous across different social apps where if you log into Resi, OpenTable, Uber Eats, that they might just say log in with Facebook. Log in with Google instead of making new username, new 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 credentials. Um, I'm just curious your thoughts on this because you know if you know reading through the article, some of this stuff's from dark reading, right? Which which is really just cyber news. Um, but but you know we we see certain comments associated with while attackers may appear opportunistic in their approach, their extensive range of post compromise activities suggest an increasing level of compromise. That's a quote. Uh, there's talk on the cloud side of things. Uh, but it just comes down to senior execs being targeted for their Microsoft 365 logins. Why Why is that a, a juicy target to go after? So um, th there's not really an easy way to say this. So I'm just going to rip the Band-Aid off on it. All right. Um, uh, a lot of executives out there um, uh, have their own uh, SOPs. We'll put it like that. Um, and I've seen it uh, firsthand, you know, in multiple, uh, multiple places. Um, you know, I will say that, uh, you know, any bad guys out there that might be watching this, um, EIT does not share this mindset. <laughs> but um, I've seen in corporations to where the executive does not have MFA enabled because okay. they don't want to be bothered with it. You know, the executive is the one who's hitting on all eight cylinders. They are, you know, uh, high speed, low drag, nonstop. They can't be bothered by that extra 30 seconds because it's, it's stacking tolerances. Yeah. Or 
they just have a superiority complex. I'm going to hurt some feelings on this one. And they just don't want to deal with it. Um, now, the reason that those are a target-rich environment is for that reason, but also everyone knows that the executive, that email coming through is going to get attention. Yes. If I get an email from Amr or Song, like that's going to be the first one I click on. I mean, like I'm, I'm going to call it like it is. That it, you know, yes. that that's that's my boss's boss's boss. Um, and so when if the bad guys get those credentials and get into that email address, that is how they start escalating privileges because the you know being real um Almer and song here at eit they don't they don't have logins to you know active directory they're not domain admins that's that's all technical stuff um our domain admin has domain admin credentials however if the executives the chiefs or whatever send him an email saying hey change this do this you're not going to get to question it you don't most of us don't have that luxury of telling our boss's boss's boss yes. no you we can't do this you know of course um and when it's you know that is the ultimate social engineering is when you actually have the true email address coming in you know like that the signatures there the right um, domains there it's not come you know it's not marked with the big yellow banner saying this is an outside and it's just a clone or they're trying to mimic they've actually got the real email yep there's no question there those tasks are going to get done you know um and it, it does happen here at the it's almost a game for us now uh on the fed ramp team the minute we hire someone within two weeks there's going to be a social engineering a, a true social engineering uh attempt coming in from one of our chiefs you know, and now it's not, you know, obviously it, it's not us doing a campaign. It is someone sending a text or something trying to, you know, work on the fact that they are new. They don't know the company those culture. Come, those come from you guys? So when no. we hire... No, no, no. Those oh, are real. oh, I was going to say, because like every person I, I, I've hired on our side, they always get, hey, uh, uh, it's Amr. Can you get me like 85 gift cards for whatever? And it's right. every person we've hired has gotten something. Uh, yeah, Th those aren't us. Th those are funny. actual, real, legit. But that, but that's because that's funny. Yeah, people know the okay. the bad guys know. You know, and it's the same thing as no, it's the new employee doesn't. You're not going to want to miss something from leadership. Exactly. Yeah. You know, there's a reason that people still get emails from Nigerian princes. I know. I still it's haven't gotten any work. of my money. Yeah, they work. And uh, like, if you shoot. Um, if, if, if it's a shotgun type blast out there, yep. one's going to hit and that's all they care about to them. It is, that is low effort across the board. And for Microsoft, yeah, I mean, like you get an executive at Microsoft and then if you go after, you know, a top developer in Azure, yep. you've got true keys to the kingdom, you know, right. like, like yeah. you've got everyone who's on an azure platform at that point right That's that becomes huge. very very dangerous right. hey re real quick uh timeline wise i know we got a about 10 minutes left on the on the run do you have a couple minutes if we bleed over or do you got to jump immediately? Okay. No. Um, I know I got a couple of things, but I, there's two two things I want to hit on. That's that one kind of goes into the regulatory side of the China story uh, and, and transitions in, uh, and and the other side is uh, wrapping up with the SEC component to it because I think that that those are really important. It covers the markets. Um, and so, is there anything you wanted to, to finish on for the Microsoft story? Uh, no, no. I mean, like I I feel like that those are the main reasons that um, you know that we talk about it uh and and that's it. once again you know when you talk about your master key type logins whether it's and, and everyone sees that you you click on uh what have you uh, and it's like hey you need to make an account you know mm -hmm. or do you just want to use your google do you want to use your outlook account do you want to use your facebook account etc yep um so that master key uh it, it gives a bad guy keys to the kingdom. You know, you have to balance that uh, convenience versus security. Uh, that's just, 
Absolutely. Yeah, the bad guys love convenience because it reduces security. All right. So two things on the, on the, the reg, the, so CISA released a, uh, on the back of Jenny Easterly's address, uh, the week after they, they released, uh, a, a, an advisory notice, uh, directly to the website, uh, people's Republic of China state sponsored actors compromise and maintain persistent access to the U S critical infrastructure. We already talked about it extensively here. here here's what I wanted to, to close on it as far as kind of transitioning from these are the breaches and incidences that happen that we want to talk about and unpack to regulatory commentary. We talked about Jenny Easterly in, in addressing the, the select house committee, House Select Committee. Um, here, here's really what I want to point out. Okay. Um, quote from CISA. U.S. authorizing agencies have confirmed that Volt Typhoon uh, has compromised the IT environments of multiple critical infrastructure organizations, primarily communications, energy, transportation systems, and Wasson waste manage, uh, wastewater systems, uh, these sectors in the continental and non-continental United States and its territories, including Guam. Uh, their choice, Volt Typhoon's choice of targets and pattern of behavior is not consistent with traditional cyber espionage or intelligence gathering operations, and the U.S. Author authoring agencies assessed with high confidence that Volt Typhoon uh, actors are pre-positioning themselves. We already talked about that. So here... It goes on to talk about it, that that if the U.S. infrastructure is disrupted, Canada will likely be affected due to cross-border integration. It continues on to talk about, as an as the authoring agency has previously highlighted, the use of living off the land techniques is hot is is a hallmark of the Volt Typhoon actors' malicious activity when targeting critical infrastructure. I want to talk about living off the land for a minute. Uh, if that's something you're able to, to unpack with us. Um, mm -hmm. What I want to comment on is if you if you listen to the last two, right, we talked about FEMA and CISA preparing for our ability to respond to disasters. This episode, we're talking about waste and water system, right? Every single one of these is probably going to receive a joint plan of how to handle an incident because they are already aware that they have affected these environments. And so my, I wouldn't be surprised if next month there is something for transportation, then another one for energy and a joint plan and a joint plan and a joint plan. It is standardizing the response processes so that people know what their roles and responsibilities are, what the plan of attack is, the less guessing, more knowing so that we can compress time, respond quickly with accuracy because they're aware that it is imminent. It's happening and it's going to 100%. happen. And so not to get back into the breach in the cyber, but more the psychology of it and how it affects governance and regulation I believe that this is the year of CISA producing unbelievable amounts of guidelines for every type of incident around critical infrastructure so that there is a playbook when things hit the fan. That's my take right. on it. Um, uh -huh. What is living off the land? Why does it why does it come to the light here? What do we what do we what should we know about this? So uh, in short, living off the land is the term of uh, a bad guy being inside of a system that only has the tools that are natively installed on the system, all right? So like when we do a penetration test here, we generally use Kali Linux that has a suite of um, penetration testing tools pre-installed on it. And then that gives us our, our tool bag so right. we can do everything. Well, in a situation to where you uh, the bad guy has compromised a server, but that server has antivirus installed, they have you know a sim installed, all of these defenses in place, they just manage to get a foothold inside of there. All right, so they're in the system, but they have zero tools. The only things that they can use are the things that are natively installed, such as on a Microsoft system, they're going to have PowerShell, they're going to have, uh, you know, a DOS, you know, uh, uh, DOS command line on a Linux machine, they're going to have access to stuff like, you know, why is that like Python? What is the benefit of living off the land and using only what's native in the environment versus bringing in? Is it lack of detectability? Like you don't leave any breadcrumbs? 100%. That's it. You, you got it exactly. You okay. know, um, when you're making that because the way most there's, there's no digital footprint. Right. Yeah. Um, now that depends. Minimal. Uh, once again. Yeah. Right. Nothing. Because, absolute. you know, like they're uh, the way most antiviruses work, uh, they they see that fingerprint of ransomware or whatever, and they stop it immediately. Well, if you write a custom one, there's no fingerprint. You know, you are creating it from nothing. Right. So it doesn't know what to look for at that point. So it just sees it as a developer 
creating a script uh, that does something. Got it. Right. Because on off the shelf antivirus is, is more or less trying to find the templated, predictable, known threats versus exactly. being a more 360 approach. So, and then on that, um, that gives us psychology and in, in the, the, the approach to the strategy, right? Uh -huh. um, I think a huge piece here that, that's really important to highlight from a governance standpoint is the shift from, this is not consistent with traditional espionage, cyber espionage, intelligence gathering, and instead is a shift in their strategy for pre-positioning. I really think that's important. And I, it's not oh, just 100%. like that to me is almost this, the little bell. And look, I'll, I'll say this, this was a 50 page release. It's, it's, it's a, there's a lot of content in here. We are probably not covering right now. You should probably take a look at it, but we want to give you the skinny on it. So you at least can understand and stay current, but there's shift from saying, how can we get in and siphon off intelligence and get our pieces of information and understand the non-obvious non-public nuances that allow us to gain an advantage and see what they're doing is very different than saying. We don't really care about that. We just want to make sure that we are next to the switch when things go, because if we're next to the switch, all we do is hit the switch. We don't need to leave with anything. Well, here's the, the game's the changed right now. Okay. All right. Talk to uh, us. Because before, uh, when living off the land, the only people that could do that type of engagement were the top of the top, you know? Like, I mean, we're in the penetration testing world, we're talking Navy SEAL type of stuff because you had to be exceedingly smart to do it. All right. Well, so it's not now, a money, it's not a money thing. It's a skill thing. Well, it was. Got it. Got now it. we have AI. Ah. Uh, All right. So you don't have to be super smart to do it anymore. You can test, tell AI hey, write me a script to do X, Y, Z in this language. And it's going to spit it out. You copy and paste it. You're in. You're done. You know? Um, so AI is changing the game across the board big time for the bad guys. You know, AI is changing it to where, um, you know, there were things that even in social engineering that you could do um, that AI can fix for social engineers at this point right. you know broken english on, on it's fixed with ai write me a write it in this you know language uh, write it in this uh you know i mean like you can have ai write a email you know in the tone of joe biden and right. it will you know um yes. and so living off the land um you know all of these types of uh, items that are coming to light right now, all of this preparedness that the government's doing, yep. you know, we're in, we're in a perfect storm right now because we have multiple conflicts across the globe yep. with superpowers across the globe with an unregulated uh, artificial intelligence that's just floating around that can do whatever it is told oh. to do. Yeah. So you've given all of these superpowers um you know navy seal structure in terms of cyber now in terms of military they don't have it but in terms of cyber everyone is on a level playing field now no one has a better uh no one has an advantage anymore interesting it's really really fascinating and so when you take that and it, it, we transition stories but i think the continuity and, and the, the 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 line of thought is you know, when the SEC rolled out their ruling that now publicly traded companies have to disclose to shareholders when there's a material breach and right? mm -hmm. there's nuances to it, you can do the reading, you know, on your own to get caught up. But that, that's that's the general. They have to. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, July of 23, the commission adopted the final rules that will require public traded uh, public companies to disclose material cybersecurity incidents as they experience. And on an annual basis, material information regarding the security risk management strategy and governance. Again, you can go into details. We're a couple quarters into this being real. OK, um, good shareholder transparency. You understand what you're investing in. It, security posture in many cases, no different than how, you know, in debt somebody is. It's just another part. It's risk. It's right. uh, let me understand the risk for the company I'm investing in. Um, 
But there's another side of that coin. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on what that other side of the coin is when these public companies have to tell the world what is vulnerable, what their state of risk management looks like, what their practices are, what incidences they experienced. 23andMe gets breached for, you know, X millions of, of T-Mobile gets breached for, you know, NF. What's the other side of it if you're an adversary and you're like, like, are you looking at this ruling and salivating because you're like, hell yeah, this just gave me the blueprint to everybody that's already getting, uh, de you know, that's already vulnerable. Like, I'm just curious your take on it. Um, or maybe am I missing the 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 the, the real, you know, part there? No, I mean, like, uh, I guess the way that I see it is, um, we're already playing catch up to the bad guys. Hmm. All right. Um, the, yes, some bad guys are going to be salivating over that as, you know, as you put it, um, it's going to, uh, provide some things, but there's a reason that we have bug bounties now. There's a reason True. that we have, um, you know, uh, that disclosure time frame, um, because it, it's just zero days. There's a reason zero day is a, is a thing, <laughs> um, so the only thing that we're doing here is we're taking away plausible deniability from organizations because going back to what I was saying before, they just want that squeaky clean report. Right. The, you know, they're, this is going to reduce that watered down effect, um, in my opinion. Um, Got it. You okay. know, so it's, uh, yeah, I see where you're coming from. Um, and yes, there's, you know, j just like with anything there's a level of risk there's it is a double-edged sword there are going to be situations to where uh, one company is compromised due to um, that report coming out and a bad guy seeing it and being like hey uh, let's go ahead and try this and they throw but, that spaghetti on the wall and it happens but your you know? your point being like they're already there right Got it. Okay. And, and that's why like, I, I like the ruling because it provides transparency in the markets. That's that's the SEC's job, right? In many right. cases, it's it's to help support uh, equity in the market, right? Um, and and to me that it does more than just provide the transparency um, because there's no bigger factor of motivating uh, an organization to do the right thing than money. Agreed. Right. In this case, exactly. The, the incentives are aligned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, let's let's uh, let's close some things out. Uh, we're not going to fully get into the uh, OWASP, uh, their release, but I do want to comment on it. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, on February 19th, uh, uh, OWASP, uh, an organization known for its efforts in improving software security, uh, their goals, they, they, they try to, uh, you know, guide organizations in securely deploying, uh, deploying large language models, all this other stuff. They came out with their own AI cybersecurity and governance checklist. It's a novel. It's it's got a lot of good stuff in there. Check it out. We'll link it in the episode. Uh, but the the main uh, the main takeaways for you, if you want a, a little skinny, just so you're kind of like, hey, I know what's going on. Um, it's designed to offer a detailed checklist for the adversarial risk mitigation, legal compliance, threat modeling, AI asset management. Uh, it, it provides some clear legal you know, actions for organizations to take when adopting and implementing uh, ethical and privacy considerations, integration into existing practices. Like it's, 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 it's got a lot of information there that allows you to understand, like we don't have to build it from zero. Uh, there are some resources. And so again, uh, Take the time to read it, but at least know that it's available. Uh, this is version one. They'll probably continue to update it on a month to month, you know, you know, quarterly basis. Um, all right. There's three events we want to comment on. And then Eric, I'll kick it to you if there's any closing thoughts before we wrap. Uh, we have a few cyber events uh, in the next few months. Uh, this will come out on Tuesday, the 27th. And uh, if you already know about it, which you should have already bought your tickets, uh, Zero Trust World 2024 in Orlando, Florida is February 26th to the 28th. Uh, SANS 2024 is also in Orlando, Florida. Uh, and that is March 24th to the uh, to the 29th. Uh, and then RSA is fast approaching in May, uh, May 6th to May 9th. A lot of good stuff. And then we are uh, with uh, our friends over at Acquia at the level up and scale with FedRAMP. Uh, it's a virtual event. It's also live in Arlington, Virginia. Their AWS H2. That is March 19th. Register. Check it out. You can check it out online. If you're local in the area or coming in, would love to meet you. See you. We'll be speaking on the post authorization process, how to, uh, uh, you know, in line with the name of it, level up and scale with FedRAMP, right? It should be designed to enable accelerated business growth. We'll be talking about that. Eric will be there. Uh, we'll have some fun. Those are the events. 
a lot going on. Uh, and as always, uh, I like the new segment with a catch up because there's probably some things that we missed in this month. We'll pick it up when we go through March's release. Mr. Dominguez, any closing thoughts before we put a bow on this episode? Um, I just think that uh, right now, um, anyone who's out there listening and, and you know, going through all of this stuff, uh, AI is going to be uh, a major player this year for um, cybersecurity. Um, so I'm really looking forward to what it's going to turn into. I don't think that it's going to fall to the wayside. I think that it's, that's the reason OWASP put out their LLM uh, security and governance checklist. Uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff coming out and um, I'm going to be doing some future blog posts and stuff like that and doing some research around AI. So be looking for those. Sounds good to me. Eric Dominguez, appreciate you, my friend. Everybody, we'll be back for more. Thank you for tuning in. All the resources from everything we've referenced will be inside the description uh, so that you could check it out yourself, right? We can only get through so much in an hour, hour 15. We encourage you to do your own due diligence and continue to expand the conversation. But this is designed to be a catch-all of the incidences and breaches that matter perspective and thought around it, how it can help build resilience in our approach moving forward, keep you current on governance, policy, regulation. We want to start implementing a little bit of the tools and tech, and then keep you focused on, on what events you may want to get to, meet some people. This is a relationship game. Meet some people, get in person, uh, and stay current so you can be the best, make an impact. My name is Jeremy Franchese, Eric Dominguez. Thank you guys for joining. We'll be back for more next time. See ya.